And now I'd like to welcome to PMP Live, David O. Stewart, celebrating the release of his paperback book, George Washington, The Political Rise of America's Founding Father. After many years as a trial and appellate lawyer, David O. Stewart became the best-selling writer of history and historical fiction. The Wall Street Journal recently called his George Washington, The Political Rise of America's Founding Father, an astounding biography with writing that is clear and superlative, providing a narrative drive such a life deserves. His other histories have explored the writing of the Constitution, the gifts of James Madison, Aaron Burr's Western Expedition and the Treason Trial, um, and the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson. He has won the Washington Writing Award the, for Best Book, the History Prize of the Society of Cincinnati twice, the George Washington Memorial Award, and the Prescott Award of the National Society of Colonial, Colonial Dames of America. His first novel, The Lincoln Deception, about the John Wilkes Booth conspiracy, was called the best historical novel of 2013 by Bloomberg View. Sequels are The Paris Deception, set at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, and The Babe Ruth Deception, which follows the Babe's first two years with the Yankees. His new trilogy, The Overstreet Saga, began, the new land, began with The New Land, released last November and follows ger the German settlers on Maine's bloody and unforgiving coast of the 1750s. Stewart will be joined in conversation with John A. Farrell, author of Richard Nixon, The Life Which Won the Penn America Award for Best Biography and the New York History so uh, Historical Society Book Prize for the Best Volume of America, American History of 2017. He was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. In 2001, he published Tip O'Neill and the Democratic Century. He's also earned a George Polk Award, the General Ford Prize, and White House Correspondence Honors for his coverage of the presidency. And so now without further ado, please welcome to PMP Live, David O. Stewart on, and John A. Farrell. Hello and welcome. Hi, Thanks how are you all? David, sure. how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, I very much enjoyed the point in your introduction that I went back to after finishing the book in which you talk about Washington's story being one of excellence achieved through great effort. And if there ever was a book that was excellence achieved through great effort in research and writing, it was this one. Like probably many generous. history buffs, I have read one or two books on Washington, several books on the revolution, and thought, boy, why do we need uh, another biography of George Washington? And I bought it because you were my friend. And boy, was that a great decision. This is a spectacular book. Um, it literally is gripping. It's, um, it's wonderful. But I'm still left with the question, why, with all the volumes about Washington, did you choose to tackle this particular audacious project? Well, let me just say quickly, you're not the first person to wonder why the heck I did it. Um, it I got that question for five years as I worked on it. Um, <laughs> it came from a couple of sources. One, the, the major one, frankly, was I had done books on the founding era before. And when I spoke you know, to audiences and got questions and just chatted with people, I, I often got the question, who was the most important person at the Constitutional Convention or with the founding of the new government or whatever? And my answer was always George Washington. And after I had given that answer a few dozen times, it struck me that maybe I was missing the point. <laughs> I was writing about the wrong people um, and that I ought to take a look at this Washington guy. Uh, and I did, and I became quite uh, focused on this statistic. I'm not the first person to notice it, but it is remarkable. He, he had four big elections in his life. He was elected commander in chief of the Continental Army. He was elected president of the Constitutional Convention. He was elected president twice. And of course, he won them all. 
but he won them unanimously. And that's, you know, that was no mean trick in the 18th century. It couldn't happen today. And I don't think except for George Washington it ever happened in the 18th century. So that seemed to me worth examining. And uh, I, so I really did wanna look at um, how did he do it? You know, we think of him as a soldier, as a farmer, as a statesman, which as you know, is the definition of a statesman as a dead politician. Um, but, you know, it, it was something other than being tall, I figured, um, although tall doesn't hurt. Uh, so that, that, that's, never the, hurts. that's the derivation. Um, you, uh, you tell a wonderful anecdote though, sort of re re revealing Washington's character um, about him showing up at the convention um, dressed in a uniform. And, and well, that's the Continental sort of Congress. Continental Congress. How this sort of speaks to um, uh, the political side of him, which of course is the, um, uh, the point of your book. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a time when he knew they were going to, we were going to war with Britain and uh, they would, you know, they were going to be generalships and he wanted to get one. And, you know, if he had asked me, uh, if I'd been back there in 1775, you know, should I wear my uniform? I would have said, no, no, that's a little obvious, George. That's not the right move. But uh, he, he read his audience correctly. And rather than seeing it as a self-promoting jerk, um, his colleagues saw it as a man who was willing to answer the call and who had military training. And at, at that Congress, the second Continental Congress, he was very engaged with the war planning that was going on with a bunch of lawyers and merchants who had no clue about how to do it. Um, and so it, it's, it's shocking. I mean, they write letters home saying, you know, this, this fellow Washington from Virginia is an impressive guy. He's a great guy. And, you know, I kept, waiting for the letter that said, you know, there's this big galoot from Virginia who showed up in a, in a uniform. I mean, what is he thinking? But they didn't. They yeah. were impressed and he, he understood. I mean, he, he read it right. Yeah. Very simply, was there nobody from New York or Connecticut or Massachusetts with the experience that he had that made him such a logical choice? Uh, he was a pretty logical choice. We had a very shallow pool of experienced military people. Um, a lot of people wanted the job, uh, but they were they would all had pretty heavy disqualifications. Um, and he always had a talent for, you know, I talk about it a lot in the book, for inspiring trust, for seeming a man of integrity and judgment. Um, and that really saw him through uh, for, for that choice. It also helped that, you know, the fighting at the time at that time was all in New England and Massachusetts, and uh, the people up there were afraid that the rest of the colonies wouldn't support them. So they wanted a Southern general, and particularly one from Virginia would be great because that's the biggest colony at the time. Uh, so there were a lot of factors that helped. Aside from being ambitious, did he have sort of a messianic vision of himself as the only one? You know, that's a great question. I, I never get that feeling from him. Uh, what he wanted more than anything, and he said it multiple times in his life, was the respect and uh, the respect of his peers, uh, that he cared about his stature. Uh, but I don't think he felt like he was the only one who could could save it, or at least he was smart enough never to say that or, you know, get it written down. Uh, and you can see, and, you know, one of the defining qualities of his career is his willingness to, to quit, <laughs> to resign. Uh, and, you know, he resigns at the end from the army at the end of the war. He resigns from the president's, I mean, he declines running for a third term. Um, that's contrary to the notion of some messianic version. I mean, he turned over the country to John Adams, for heaven's sake. Uh, <laughs> that takes a lot of confidence in your fellow man. Uh, and uh, so, so I, I think he did not shy from responsibility. He wanted it. 
but you know he I, I think he would have served under another general if if one had been there and been chosen yeah so that's the first election and the second third and fourth occur after the war correct? yes and he comes out of the war victorious but with big debts to the french and a somewhat checkered strategic reputation that gets bailed out by the fact that he ha- he manages to win you know the, the battle right before the uh, wolves get to the get to the door why was he so so venerated uh, you know winning the war makes a lot of earlier sins go away um I think Americans understood, most Americans understood that this was an uphill battle, that, you know, the British were actually pretty good at war and uh, had a lot of money. So, uh, and they understood what a struggle it was. So I I think they gave him all the credit in the world. And, you know, it was a brilliant move to resign um, because that was him saying to everybody else, listen, I'm not power crazy. You know, I, I, I'm happy to go home, find somebody else. I'll be good. Um, and, you know, somebody who can walk away from power is somebody you can trust with power. I, we used to have a saying in my old law firm, we had a managing committee. And the saying was that if somebody wanted to be on the committee, they shouldn't be on it. <laughs> If there's somebody who wants to have power over the rest of us, yeah. then, you know, they shouldn't get it. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was a, I, I don't think it was a savvy career move and that that's the only reason he did it, but it proved to be a really savvy career move. Yeah. Um, another thing that struck me, though I had read about this man so many times, um, was how young he was going into the war and how young all of them were. This was really a bunch of, in some cases, 20 somethings, but otherwise um, uh, 30 somethings and, and, and life was much briefer then. How do you as a writer sort of get yourself around that idea that if you made, you made it to 45 or 50, you lived a nice um, long life and being the commanding general of all Virginia forces on the frontier at 23 was something to be expected. Well, that was actually him getting the Virginia regiment at the incredibly young age he did was pretty outstanding. I mean, that, that was unusual. Um, you know, there, there had been Alexander the Great. There certainly were people who had done similar things, but that was remarkable. And frankly, he wasn't quite ready for that responsibility. Um, I, I do think uh, the uh, perilous nature of life in that era without antibiotics, without medical care of any significant quality, you know, actually the doctors ultimately probably killed him, um, it, it is something I, I did labor to get across. Um, he was a big, healthy, athletic guy, and he got really sick a bunch of times in his life. Uh, you know, with his life hanging in the balance. Uh, I was struck, and I, I know I made this remark that, you know, the problem wasn't only infant mortality, the problem was parent mortality. And there were an amazing number in the 18th century of blended, what we would call blended families, where, you know, you got a, a woman with a few kids and a guy with a few kids, and they've both lost their partners, and so they marry and you get this blended family. And, you know, Washington marries Martha after her, her husband dies in his in mid-40s. So, you know, life was pretty treacherous. You know, Washington's siblings all died, and he was the eldest of five uh, in his cohort of the family. He had two older half-brothers, but he outlived all his younger siblings. Um, you know, life, was, and he always talked about how Washington men are not long lives. Which, yeah, yeah. which they were not. His, his father died at you know early forties, and it's um, maybe we can identify more with it in these since the arrival of uh, the pandemic, um, when you that, that bell starts taking member after member of um, 
of his immediate family and also of his of his friends. Um, the opening to the book um, I found fascinating because it's a a moment you don't think of when you think of George Washington, which is George Washington down and out, and not just down and out, but suffering from a hideously uncomfortable and debilitating disease and plotting his way home on a horse, um, thinking that, um, thinking what, his career was over, thinking um, I've, uh, I've reached the, uh, the, the bottom. Um, and, uh, and then amazingly then um, uh, turning it around. Uh, what made you decide to start with that particular anecdote? Was it to humanize him for us? A lot of that was because of that. We, we tend to see him as a marble man, the guy on the dollar bill who's, you know, sort of austere and unapproachable. And I wanted to make him more human. Um, I think he was an, he was an emotional guy. He was an ex emotionally accessible guy, but we don't think of him that way. And that's a time when he really was uh, in terrible shape. He had failed in his military mission for three years. Um, he was supposed to keep the Indians in check during the French and Indian War, and he couldn't. It wasn't his fault. Uh, they were just much better fighters in the forest than his troops were. And uh, he was terribly sick with dysentery. And uh, the doctor told him, you know, if he didn't go to bed, he was going to die. You know, that's sort of a wake up call when you're 25. Uh, and he then really goes into seclusion of a sort, you know, on he, he had Mount Vernon at the time. Um, so you couldn't really be in seclusion since there were servants and slaves about, but uh, he didn't have much social connection with anybody else for, for weeks and months. Uh, he was probably quite sick, but I think he was also pretty low. Um, his natural resilience did kick in uh, ultimately, and he comes roaring back, but uh, it felt to me like um, we've all had those times, maybe not in the same context, but there's always times you just not on top of the world. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it would be easier to see him as someone, uh, someone real if, if yeah. we had that look. Yeah. And you also talk about him uh, being fun loving, which is incredibly hard to convey because <laughs> you never hear that about George Washington. Yeah. I, I, I want to be clear. He was not a jokester. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, there was, uh, you know, he spent the last 25 years of his life. Everybody wrote down every word he ever said uh, and nobody wrote down a joke. So <laughs> I don't think he was funny himself. But by all accounts, he liked, you know, a sociable evening with a lot of horsing around. He, he would laugh at good jokes. He liked to play cards and gamble, um, go to the races. Uh, you know, he was just, you know, he was a Virginia guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing that you conveyed to me uh, was the, um, uh, the fact that he was tall was one thing, but also that he was a amazing horseman. And of course, to be a good horseman, to ride in the hunt and just to be a commanding figure on a horse was sort of like being the Michael Jordan of the day in Virginia uh, society, was it not? I mean, this must have been somebody that um, people wanted to come watch just because he was such an amazing athletic figure. I, I think, you know, we, we respect physical talents as well as other talents, and he had them. It, it, made his presence uh, more impressive. And he understood that, he knew how to use it. And, uh, uh, you know, even Jefferson, who was pretty skeptical of Washington in many respects, um, described him as the best horseman of, of the age. Uh, he really, I guess, was something special. And yeah, in Virginia, that mattered. I mean, it was how you got anywhere, <laughs> it was important. <laughs> Um, the other thing that you point out is the lessons that he learned from this early military um, experience, that the British were not uh, infallible, um, and that losing a battle does not mean losing the war. Tell us a little bit about the, not so much the chronology, but, but the, the, the history of him on the frontier and what 
where what events happened that he would have gotten these lessons from? Well, there are two major event uh, events. I think he gets both lessons from, which is uh, first is Braddock's March, which is in 1755. General Braddock from Britain comes over to win the war out in the Western Virginia and Western Pennsylvania. He's got a couple of uh, units of regulars with him and they march with a bunch of Virginians. And he walks into the worst slaughter that British arms suffered for centuries. Um, something like two thirds of the men either were missing killed or wounded. It, it was a horror. Um, and in fact, Washington's the only guy who comes out of that with any kind of uh, honor. Um, and then three, three years later, General Forbes is leading a similar uh, assault. They're, they're, everybody's trying to get the forks of the Ohio, which is where Pittsburgh is, which is the strategic. But still, they end up getting to um, the Forks of the Ohio, which was then Fort Duquesne, uh, and taking it from the French and basically prevailing in that theater of the war, even though by any real calculation, they had never lost, uh, never won a battle. And does he comment on this during the revolution? Does he actually state, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to Braddock and I know that he, even though things look hard here at Valley Forge, um, we'll be able to pull it out. And, you know, the, the British are not as uh, infallible as they think. Somewhat maddeningly, he, did, he doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, he is not a confessional guy. He does not sort of uh, reveal his, his thinking much of the time. You, it, you have to infer it. Yeah. Well, it's very, uh, I thought that the, um, maybe you agree or not, the, uh, the figure of, Ham of Washington in the musical, uh, Hamilton, I thought, sort of captured both the um, uh, the pride and also the uh, the modesty, and uh, I like that portrayal. How about you? I, I love the show. I think they were they were fair to Washington. I love the song that Jefferson and Madison sing. Wouldn't it be nice to have Washington on our side? Because that's exactly right. Because yeah. whatever he wanted is is what mostly happened. Uh, so I, you know, they, they cut a few historical corners, but I, I have no problem with it. Yeah. And the portrayal of Washington. Yeah, I, I, I liked it fine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's. Uh, I'm going to need a right hand man. <laughs> yeah. I'm, you know, they he he exaggerates Hamilton's significance. Uh, this was the part of the story that I found most uh, revelatory to me. I, I, I was drawn to it because, you know, he, he's sort of a, uh, he, he acts badly um, at the end of the, his time in the French and Indian War, and he offends all of his superiors, and he, he becomes bumptious and pretty much obnoxious. Um, and then he shows up at the Continental Congress 16 years later, and he's George Washington. You know, he's Mr. Smooth. He's affable. He's somebody people trust. So, we, you know, he got older, which often helps. But he also, I think, learned a lot um, from his experiences. And his experiences were in colonial and local government, uh, which I think provided really a graduate education in uh in government, in public administration. Uh, he was 16 years in the House of Burgesses, uh, not a natural legislator by all, any means. Uh, he was a, not a good speaker. He had a weak voice and he disliked the cut and thrust of debate. He, he didn't feel quick on his feet ever and he, he wasn't. Um, he, was, he was right about trying to avoid debate, which he always did. Um, he also uh, served as the justice of the Fairfax County Court, which was really, a. It, there were judicial duties, but there also were um, responsibilities for managing the affairs of the county, which involved road building and managing the tobacco trade and other uh, economic activities. And uh, he really learned about working with people, getting them to uh, agreement 
uh, and getting things done. Uh, the one outstanding feature of Washington through this period, you know, he's not a political philosopher. Um, you know, Adams and Jefferson both sort of say snotty things about him not being, you know, he's really not all that smart. But he had two features which, you know, really always kept him, stood him in good stead. First was um, he just had great judgment. Um, and, you know, you don't get that with box tops. That's something you have to figure out. Um, and he also was the hardest working man around. Uh, he had a lifetime of 12 and 14 hour days and he got things done. Mm -hmm. um, he just had a gift for getting things done, getting people to agree to things, getting them to, he was great at motivating people. Heavens, he got his soldiers through eight years of agony. Um, so that those qualities earned him the, you know, regard and trust of others. And, you know, the fact that he didn't give a very good speech turned out not to be a, a showstopper. Mm -hmm. Now, you were married to an extremely skilled politician and a lovely person. Um, but uh, did you uh, observe closely over the years and pick up some of the uh, um, ins and outs of politics that uh, led you to appreciate more in what Washington was doing in this time period? You know, my, my wife, Nancy Florine, who was on the Montgomery County Council for uh, 16 years uh, and the planning board before then, uh, did offer me a window into um, decision makers and policy makers and what they go through. <laughs> One thing that she was always harassing me about is don't be so hard on the incumbents. It's harder to do this job than you think. Um, and uh, it was a good reminder, um, getting uh, people to sort of uh, come together and do something um, is not easy. Uh, and seeing uh, the influence in a collegial body, and you know, I just have it secondhand, of course, but the influence of you know, bluntly small quirks in personality, um, how that can affect how people are perceived and whether something gets done um, is, is very useful. You know, I, I was never a reporter like you were, but I spent a couple of years right out of college covering the state legislature in Albany. And, you know, that also was an opportunity to, you know, see politicians and, you know, the obnoxious ones tend to have, it's not a secret. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people notice. Um, yeah. And if you get along with people and if you're constructive, people notice that too. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, was Washington thin-skinned? Thin-skinned? Thin-skinned, yes. You bet. <laughs> he hated to be criticized. And, you know, one of the less attractive qualities of his personality was uh, he, I, I'm not sure I could say he ever admitted making a mistake. Um, he would change his behavior in response to a failure. Um, he would change a course. He would change his strategy. But he would never say, I goofed. Um, that just really wasn't in his vocabulary. Um, and there's no question that when he was criticized, uh, particularly as president, when he already felt like um, he, he had, in his second term, he had a bit of an attitude that uh, he didn't really have to do this job anymore and they should be glad he was there. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were people out there calling for his impeachment in the newspapers. I mean, it wasn't a great time. And uh, there is a famous occasion in a cabinet meeting when he uh, evidently carried forth and shouted for, you know, it's described as half an hour. I suspect it's not that long. Nobody can keep that up. But, you know, if it's only 15 minutes, I mean, that would be exhausting uh, <laughs> to, to shout for that long. So he had a temper. He struggled to maintain it all his life. He usually did, but he could lose it. Yep. Uh, another question, how do we accept the fact, or how do we deal with the fact that um, our guy um, on Mount Rushmore and on the dollar bill um, uh, owned slaves, 
um, and as you point out in the book, was not always the most benevolent of owners. Yeah, it's uh, it's something we have to look at, face and you know look in the eye. Uh, my perception from research was that until he goes off in the Revolutionary War, he was not uh, troubled. Uh, there's no evidence that he's troubled about slavery. His practices as a slave owner are not those of anybody who's suffering from qualms of conscience. I think during the Revolutionary War, having black soldiers suffer and die for his liberty uh, changed him uh, and made him appreciate uh, that slavery was a crime. He, he resolves to become a a good slave owner. That means you don't break up families and that sort of thing. And he realized, I think within a couple of years that that was an oxymoron, that, that, that there are no good slave owners. And he actually spent 10 years trying to figure out how to end slavery at Mount Vernon. Um, it was a tricky uh, legal problem. The most of the uh, majority of the slaves were owned by Martha, this uh, dead husband's estate. Um, and as a legal matter, Washington couldn't sell them off. Well, he could sell them, but he couldn't just free them. Um, he owed the estate. He was the manager of the uh, affairs because she was a woman and had no rights to manage anything. And that's another subject. Um, but uh, those, the value of the slaves had to be retained in the estate. So the only way to free them was to buy them himself and then free them. He, and he tried to do that. Uh, he owned a lot of land out West that he thought he could sell. He couldn't sell it. He thought he could lease it. He couldn't lease it. Uh, and it, it just never worked. So just a few months before his death, he changed his will uh, and uh, to provide for the freeing of his own slaves. Uh, which he did, uh, and, and they were freed after his death. Um, he never spoke publicly against slavery, which, you know, I think modern people could hold against him. Um, he spoke privately on a number of occasions with people and said that he wished legislation would be adopted as had been adopted in the Northern states to, for a gradual end to slavery. Um, and, you know, when, whoever was in bondage reached a certain age, they would become free, uh, which is how the Northern states by, uh, by and large did it. And uh, he did not say it publicly. I think he made the calculation that uh, it would be incredibly divisive and wouldn't change anything. Um, you could look at it as an act of cowardice. Um, I don't, but you could. And uh, I think his final act of freeing his own slaves was an act of atonement. Uh, I think he, he felt guilty about this. And uh, he, you know, he writes to a friend at one point about that act. Um, I hope it will not be displeasing to my maker. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, he developed a moral sense about it. Um, he didn't have it for uh, longer than you would think. Yeah. Um, when we look at the different motivations for George Washington becoming um, joining the joining the rebellion, um, we talk about you talk about the just spoke about the great land holdings he had um, out west. Uh, it was the time of the Enlightenment, so the culture uh, was talking about independent men, and 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 uh, um, uh, he had suffered the. Um, snubs of the British um, army. Um, he had, of course, he had ambition. Um, and lately, of course, as you know, uh, the 1619 project um, has suggested that a primary reason um, for the revolution was fear of the slave by the slaveholders that the British were going to do away with um, slavery. In your research, I'm not trying to pick a fight here, but uh, in your research, did you come across indications that Washington uh, had that fear and that that motivated him? No, uh, you know, the 1619 project gets very 
wrapped around the axle over Lord Dunmore's proclamation. He was the colonial governor in Virginia who in the second half of 1775 issues a proclamation that uh, if slaves join the British cause and fight for the British, then they can be free. And sure enough, some slaves respond and that made a lot of sense. Uh, and, you know, Southerners, certainly like Washington, um, found that annoying. And it also was a strategic issue. If enough slaves joined the British, that would be hard um, to win the war. But that all happens after Bunker Hill, after Lexington and Concord, after Washington is commander in chief of the uh, Continental Army. I mean, they're in rebellion. Washington wrote in 1769, six years before that, that he was prepared to fight the British. Um, so that's not why he did this. And, and no, you know, there's no writings where anybody says, this is why we did it. And you would never think the British would, you know, free your slaves. I mean, they kept slavery in the Caribbean for the next 50 years in their Caribbean colonies. There was no abolition movement in Britain at this time. So, you know, they're taking this one thing that isn't all that important, to be honest. You know, Dunmore was sort of a goof. And, you know, they didn't really think very seriously about him. And he certainly never had a significant battle. Um, and they're, they're exaggerating its, its impact. So, you know, I understand the motivation, um, but it's, it's just, I, I don't see a historical basis for it. Um, uh, another question from our audience, was George Washington really as honest and upright as we are taught? Or was, was he more or less still a politician? Well, of course he was a politician. Um, I, you know, I don't think he lied a lot. Um, you know, something that was a little disillusioning for me is um, in business dealings, he was tough and uh, he, he, he would drive a hard bargain. Um, and one of the reasons he never sold his lands uh, to buy the slaves out of uh, uh, bondage was that, you know, he didn't like the prices he was being offered and he wasn't going to sell for less than he thought it was worth. Um, he, and he was anxious about money his whole life. He, he was always nervous about it. He, he'd had actually some pretty uh, penurious years as a teenager. Um, I, I think as we think of politicians, he was extremely honest. He certainly you know, did nothing in terms of a, 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 a personal uh, corruption that we would worry about, but also in what he said. Um, he was very careful about what he said. His great advice to his grandchildren was always, uh, step-grandchildren was always, you know, don't say anything until you're sure exactly what you think about a subject. And he followed that advice. So uh, you don't find him zigzagging around. You don't find him, you know, people saying, the, you know, the old coot double-crossed me. Um, you know, maybe Edmund Randolph felt that way, but Randolph had caused his own problems. This is the attorney general who essentially got dismissed. Um, but uh, I, I think, you know, in our history, he is right at the top of the list on honesty and integrity and, and belongs there. Mm -hmm. um, a question, did he get along and with, and what did he think of some of the famous contemporaries, Hamilton, Jefferson, Burr, and Adams? Oh my, uh, he valued Hamilton's talents tremendously. Um, and in, he found Hamilton a little uh, prickly at times, uh, but you know he relied on him greatly. Uh, Hamilton is the one of that list who always stood by him. And I think that loyalty uh, meant a ton to, Washington. Um, he regarded Madison in a similar way. He thought he was just wicked smart and really helpful. Um, they were the closest of polit political confidants for five or six years. Um, I think he was sad that Madison went up into opposition uh, to his administration, but he didn't feel like it was personal. And Madison was pretty good at disagreeing without being disagreeable. Um, I don't think he thought much about Adams. 
<laughs> which is not a fair thing to say, but um, it, it just doesn't come up a lot. Uh, and, you know, in his last year in office, he does finally sit down for some serious conversations with Adams about what's going on in the country. But there's no evidence he did that for the first seven years they were in office together. Um, Jefferson's a special case. Uh, he had great regard for Jefferson's talents, uh, but he felt quite double-crossed by Jefferson um, in, in the cabinet, that his cabinet minister was working against him uh, and uh, coordinating the opposition against him, which was true. Uh, and, and bluntly, I don't think he ever forgave him. And you know, one of the things I was surprised to come upon is a, is a letter by Martha um, after uh, George has died, he said, re reports that, well, Mr. Jefferson came by to pay his respects. And that was the second worst day of my life. <laughs> so um, I think th there was, you know, there were hard feelings about that. And what, was, was Burr enough of a figure that he even paid any attention to him? I don't think he really gave uh, uh, a lot of a darn about Burr. Um, the only thing we know, and I just know this having done the Burr book, is that there was like a week during the war when Burr was assigned to Washington's headquarters as an aide. And that was a great opportunity. You know, if you got close to Washington, you were close to the power. And, you know, Hamilton grabbed it with both hands, as did Lafayette, as did a bunch of guys who, whose careers Washington made. Burr wasn't buying it. He thought Washington was, you know, this stuff shirt, um, wasn't very smart, wasn't a very good soldier. And so he, he got himself transferred out. And I think, I'm guessing Washington was glad to see him go. Uh, another lesson for today's times, there was a lot of intrigue um, in those days, both before, well, he was gen commander in general, he faced a mutiny um, yes. and a secret cabal. Um, as president, he had uh, little re uh, armed rebellions uh, by uh, um, Americans against the central uh, government. And uh, in all cases, he reacted firmly, but not as a despot. Yeah, he was careful. Uh, he, 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 he understood that the American experiment, which was a f phrase that's in, uh, I think, well, is properly in vogue, um, needed special consideration. So when he was facing the cabal and the army. Um, he had a great strategic sense. And he, in many respects, he just sat quietly, built his bridges to Congress and let the conspirators sort of um, shoot themselves in the foot and, and then do it again. Um, and that was very successful. The rebellion, which is the Whiskey Rebellion you're referring to, um, was a very different matter. It was very open. Um, they had 5,000 people uh, in a military drill on out near Pittsburgh um, in opposition to the government. It was a serious thing. He assembled a very powerful force of militia and marched, and they went off and marched west and the opposition just disintegrated. And he was not at all vindictive. You know, they arrested the leaders and most of them were let free and a couple were tried and convicted and then he pardoned them. Um, you know, he knew that the idea was to bring the country together and to be president of everybody. And, you know, that settling scores was not going to improve uh, the prospects for the, this republic that, you know, was pretty much built on sand those early years. Um, uh, very quickly, um, of the other great Washington, other great Washington biographies, um, which do you think you, uh, which biographer do you think you differ most from? You know, that I get the most from? Well, the question is, how does your portrait differ from those painted by such biographers as oh. Freeman, Chernow, Flexner, and others? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think uh, my emphasis on his, his, his political life is different and my focus on his, this sort of interim period, what you might call the wilderness period, um, is different. I think a lot of people just skip over that and say, well, you know, he was, uh, you know, a master of slaves and uh, raised a bunch of crops and uh, rode to the hounds. And they don't 
taken very seriously. And um, I, I think there's a corrective that, that's due there. Uh, and and uh, I'm glad to do that. So I think that's the the, the principal distinction. And uh, you know, he's uh, we swing back and forth on all of our historical judgments. Um, and you know, he was not a man without flaws. But uh, we were remarkably fortunate to have him as our first president and as our, our military chief during the war. All right, real fast. Greatest president of all time. Uh, I'm going to hedge that one. Uh, <laughs> it's, Link it's Lincoln and Washington. Uh, they were both outstanding and amazing. And I always want to quote what David McCullough said, which is the reason we make such a fuss about our outstanding presidents is there are so few of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Patricia has a question. Is there anyone comparable in today's world, anyone close to George Washington? No, uh, and, and I'm not sure our political system allows it. Um, it. It's just too beholden to money. It's too uh, instantaneous. I mean, Washington would have trouble coping with this because he liked to think about stuff for a few days and to talk to everybody and get their views. and. You know, everything's just, you know, bang, bang, bang. And uh, that would be hard for him. Uh, so uh, I don't see a figure where I, I say, well, gee, he sure reminds me of George. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, another question. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the musical Hamilton, they wrote a beautiful song about this from Kevin. Washington's farewell address is well remembered. What was his inspiration? Uh, I think he want, he felt a tremendous sense of duty and obligation to this country. And he'd had an amazing chance to be important in forming it and shaping it. And he wanted to take a last uh, swing. I mean, he knew he was going off into retirement and, you know, wasn't going to be important anymore. Uh, and you know, he, I, I think, you know, he wanted to do that, but there's also some regret, you know, he's not going to be the, the guy. Uh, he's not going to be in the room where it happens if we could stick with Hamilton. Um, so I, I think he wanted to leave a marker. Uh, and I, you know, his, his words about uh, uh, partisanship uh, still reverberate and resonate with us and, and should and were very important. And uh, I, I wish, I hope everybody who's stuck it, stuck it out through our technical <laughs> issues here tonight um, might uh, look it up online. Um, it, it's, it's more than just a page or two, but it's, it's wise. It's wise in a way that uh, not many state papers are, and, and it's worth spending a few minutes with. Yeah. Um, Linda asks, did Washington have any correspondence with Lord Fairfax during the revolution? That's a great question. Um, and I, mostly because I actually know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, they tried to, they wrote to each other and, and not, well, I, I'm not sure he, if he was Lord, Fa Lord Fairfax, Lord Fairfax or not, but George William Fairfax was his good friend who was the neighbor. And uh, the, the, actual title tended to float around. And he went back to England before the revolution and uh, they tried to write to each other and did write to each other, but the letters never reached. And both of them thought that their governments were intercepting them and reading them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the surve government surveillance was not unheard of in the 18th century. Um, and they did resume their correspondence untroubled by government uh, censors after the war. Um, and they wrote very charming letters to each other. Uh, they, they were great friends. I, George William Fairfax was one of his closest friends uh, through his life. And a social benefactor, I guess social benefactor is the way to put it, a, uh, a friend of the family. A, uh... Yeah, it was really his dad. 
um, who was Sir William Fairfax, who uh, was a great sponsor for Washington as a young man. Uh, he had been a member of the executive council in the, uh, of the colony. And he got, he's the guy who sort of pushes Washington into responsible positions and, uh, uh, and gives him good advice. He's really a mentor as well as a sponsor. Uh, so, uh, and, and George William is more of a peer uh, and, and just, you know, he, he and his wife and George and Martha would go, you know, they, they went off on vacation together. I mean, they actually were, were chums. Yeah. Um, I was watching your appearance at the National Archives the other day, and uh, I thought you told a uh, um, terrific story. Maybe you want to, we can get you to share it here now. Your take on the room where it happened. Uh, story and song, the, the great deal that was supposedly made between the Hamilton and his Southern counterparts that gave us the capital and the Potomac. And uh, in the play, it's all about those guys, but uh, yeah. you're not um, so sure. I, I just think we've, we've had this wrong for a long time. And, you know, it's because Jefferson wanted to take credit for it is, is my view, but <laughs> uh, the, issue was where would the national capital be? And there were a bunch of candidates and Washington wanted it on the Potomac. Uh, and then was, what would we do with the state debts coming out of the war when there were big debts and Hamilton wanted to take them over and bring them into the federal government. So the uh, creditors, the people who would be getting the money would support the federal government to get paid. Um, and there was a real, you know, they, they went round and round on this. Uh, they had a terrible time coming to a uh, final uh, agreement on it. It was clear that some kind of deal had to be made. And uh, they, uh, the, the story that has always come down was that, and Jefferson writes this 25 years later in his uh, Anas, which is, not altogether reliable source um, that, you know, there was a dinner that he presided over, but he didn't really, wasn't involved in the bargaining and Madison and Hamilton uh, hammered out a deal where uh, the capital would go on the Potomac and the state debts would be assumed by the federal the national government. And I just think we've missed the, uh, the obvious point there that everybody in that room, Jefferson, Hamilton and Washington and, and Madison was acting for, for Washington. You know, uh, Jefferson and Hamilton were members of his cabinet appointed by him serving at his pleasure. Um, he was the boss and Madison was his closest political ally for the last five years and was really the administration's mouthpiece in Congress at the time. So they're just trying to make happen what the boss wants. And the ultimate deal is not what any of either any of them wants. You know, Madison want and Jefferson want don't want the, the assumption of the debts. Uh, Hamilton certainly doesn't want the uh, capital on the Potomac. He wants it up in some place, you know, where they're uh, farther north. Um, the only guy who gets everything he wants is Washington. So why don't we figure out that? Gee, he, he, it's his deal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he told them to go make it happen and they did uh and there's there's other evidence that supports this inference so i i uh, i'm hoping others will pay attention to that that's a great way it's a great eye-opening way to look at it um uh, they've given us time for one more question because we had those technical difficulties um and so following along that same line what was Washington's role in the Constitutional Convention? Because he doesn't seem to be um, an actor in the accounts that we that we have. Right, in, including the one I wrote. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is, uh, it, it's pivotal. Uh, if he doesn't go to that convention, uh, it might not have happened. Or if it had happened, they might not have gotten agreement. And if they'd got an agreement, it might not have been ratified. At every stage, it was essential that Washington support it. He was the hero of the revolution. He was, you know, we had no other national symbols um, 
we weren't really a nation yet. Um, and his presence and support were the one, you know, uh, uh, indispensable uh, parts of it. What he, he didn't get involved in the horse trading and the speechifying over it. Um, he wanted three basic things from the constitution. He wanted to have a national government that was superior to the states. He wanted the national government to have taxing power and he wanted there to be an executive branch, which, and we hadn't had any of those, which is sort of amazing. And he didn't really think what we had before then under the Articles of Confederation was really a, a government. And, you know, it was a pretty good point of view, actually. So he got those, you know, nobody argued about that stuff. They just agreed, you know, because they knew Washington wanted it. And also it made sense. Uh, so the rest of it, you know, how many houses in the legislature, what's the veto worth and, you know, when had, would he override? He was, you know, that was stuff he was willing to let other people sort out, which was itself sort of a powerful thing to do. It was saying to the other people in that room, I trust you, because everybody knew he'd be the first president. And he was basically saying, do the best you can, and I'll, I'll do my best to make it work. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, those are all really interesting acts of leadership and, you know, giving your trust to other people um, it, it is often hard, but it's also can be a very uh, powerful uh, em empowerment. Mm -hmm. Well, David, thanks a lot. I don't know. Um, I don't know how we wrap up. Um, well, I'm but, pretty uh, sure. Oh, here we go. Us off. From politics and prose is back. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both so much. And thank you everyone for um, figuring out our technical difficulties. I apologize about that. Um, this will be on our YouTube channel. Um, so I, I'll send a link out to everyone who is here and it looks like everybody got back on. So that's great. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you, is fantastic. So David and, and John, thank you both so much for, for this great conversation. Um, I want to let you know, I put the link in the chat to purchase a book straight from the politics and prose website. So please, please go there, click on that link and purchase a book, buy a couple, give them to friends. Um, and we, we have, we have more events coming up. So check out our calendar and uh, thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here and joining us. And David, that was fantastic. John, you did a you did a great job moderating. So thank you Thanks all so again. Much. Thanks. Yeah. Good night. Have a good night.